The morning in Salt Lake City was nice, it was warm, it was bright, and the car started just fine, full power. Although I definitely took my friend's advice seriously, I didn't feel I had much of an option where I was located. So my only hope was that as long as the vehicle kept running and I didn't turn it off, the power would continue to stay full. And coming from a family that's full of mechanics and truck drivers, including auto racing, I can only imagine the way they'd be rolling their eyes hearing my logic right now. In my defense though, my mind was elsewhere. It was on my grandfather, it was on my mom and wondering how she's doing, and I just wanted to get home as quick as I possibly could. Now I had mapped it out. Ogden, Utah was about a half hour north of Salt Lake, so I was sure that the vehicle could get there, and any issues in between, it wasn't that far away. And then once getting through Ogden, Twin Falls, Idaho was less than three hours. So the car's got to be able to make it that far. After driving for quite a while, with the wide open skies and the endless highway, the car begins to lose power again. But hey, there's no reason to panic, right? Just like yesterday, I'll get it to the next town. Except there is no next town because it's losing power and it's losing speed and there's nothing around except for endless highway and endless sky. And now the very real scenario is being set up like a Hollywood scene. A broken down vehicle in the middle of nowhere on the side of the road? What the hell am I gonna do? And then all of a sudden, in the distance, there's a sign and it says rest area. I managed to coast the car into the rest area and into a parking spot, and then it's dead. There happens to be a public phone at the rest area, so I'm able to call a tow truck company, and they're going to arrive in about a half hour. When I tell this story, and I line up the pattern of events, it's just pure serendipity. Because the crazy thing is, had this have happened a kilometer earlier, two kilometers earlier, I had no idea where I was. I had no idea there was a rest area I had, and there certainly was nothing in behind. So this stroke of good luck really did relieve a lot of the panic. When the tow truck arrived, the driver looked at the vehicle and said point blank, the motor's shot, it's dead. And then he said, you have two options. He said, I can drive you to a car dealership or I can drive you to the rental car service. Which one do you like? He actually offered to drive to the car rental service. That was in Twin Falls. That was about two hours away. During this part of the drive, the tow truck driver came up with an idea. He said that one of his friends owned a mechanic shop and he might be willing to buy the car. He made a quick phone call. He told his friend about the situation and his friend offered $400 for the car. There really wasn't much of an option though can't just leave the vehicle in the United States or try to find a used motor somewhere. Maybe they could drop it into the vehicle, but who knows how that would turn out. At the airport in Twin Falls, the vehicle was emptied of all of the personal belongings, put back up on the truck and disappeared. It's the last time I ever saw it. Here's a funny little tidbit to go with the story. Inside the rental office, renting a vehicle, $400. I actually started to laugh. How would the driver and the mechanic possibly know that a rental vehicle would cost $400? And how would they coincidentally just offer $400 for the car? It's almost like they've come across this scenario maybe once or twice. And now something extra that's going to prolong the trip. The car can't be dropped off in Canada. It had to be dropped off in the United States. So that meant Bellingham. And now it's the time to scramble a bit where you're looking for somebody who has a passport to cross the border with a vehicle that can carry all of the personal belongings. I remember it being about 2 a.m. at the Bellingham airport. My sister arrived. And so now having to unload all the personal stuff from the rental vehicle and then into her vehicle and then the drive across the border to get home 
and put an end to this long trip. I spent the rest of that summer hanging out with my family and playing some other open mics. I drove up to Kamloops and Salmon Arm and played there. I played in New Westminster. I played in Mission at the Dudney. And to put a really good final stamp on this whole journey, I played in Vancouver at the end of September. I actually was contacted by somebody I met on the road. That was Tom Savage. He was the open mic host in Kingston. He was actually making his way to the West Coast and had a bunch of shows lined up. And he asked if I wanted to open for him, and I said yes. I learned that meeting new musicians, and making friends with them, and networking can really open up a lot of opportunities. That's the reason I got that gig in Vancouver from Tom. In the same way that I got that first gig in Stainer, Ontario from the Beaten Boomers. It really is being a part of your community. sense to me now. 